Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this online event which celebrates the completion of a three-year project to digitize medieval manuscripts from German-speaking lands held in the Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford, and the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel, Germany. My name is Richard Ovenden, and I have the pleasure of being Bodley's librarian here at the Bodleian Libraries, University of Oxford. It is my special pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Julia Gross, Chargé d'Affaires at the German Embassy in London, who are our partners in presenting this evening's event. As you can see, most of the speakers are in the Bodleian's Western Library Lecture Theatre this evening, but due to the constraints of the pandemic, some of the participants, myself included, are beaming in from various European locations, very appropriate given the distributed digital nature of this project. The project has been generously supported by the Polonsky Foundation, who I would like to thank warm, very warmly indeed from the outset for their financial support, of course, but equally for their strong encouragement, advice and guidance throughout the project. Both Leonard and Mark Polonsky have been wonderful, inspiring co-conspirators, and we have benefited greatly from Nicola Pullman's expertise. What did we set out to achieve when the Bodleian and the Herzog August Bibliothek first embarked on this initiative? Firstly, it was to enable the rich holdings of medieval manuscripts from German speaking lands held in our two libraries to be made available online. Our project had a key target to digitize 600 manuscripts and to make every page of those manuscripts freely available online a target we have exceeded between the two institutions, bringing more than 230,000 pages of medieval learning, literature, ideas, religious faith and practice to your screen. You can access these digitized images from each of the library's own digital platforms and from one specially created for this project. Secondly, we sought to enhance scholarship through promoting these materials from our shared medieval heritage that would enable scholars and students to better understand our histories and our cultures. Our third objective was to foster collaboration and cooperation between our two institutions, to share experience, techniques, technologies and approaches, and to foster relationships between the institutions and individuals involved in the project. As I hope you will see from the rest of this evening's program, we have more than achieved these three main objectives. And in fact, we added another in the course of our work to promote wide engagement with a broader public of the outputs of our digital project and of the medieval originals from which the project is based. In order to demonstrate this, we are joined by a wonderful panel of speakers this evening. And in a moment, we will show a short film about the work of the two libraries, the project team, and, uh, and to share some of the outcomes and our experiences of doing the work over the past three years. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce my co-host for this evening. Julia Gross took up her posi present position as Deputy Head of the German Embassy in London in 2018, after four years as Head of Division for Human Resources at the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin. Educated at Cologne University and at Aberdeen University, she entered the Diplomatic Academy in 1993. From 1996 to 99, she worked at the German Embassy in Tirana and then moved to the Embassy in London for three years and from 2004 to 7 was stationed in New York as part of the German permanent representation of the United Nations. She then was Deputy Head of Mission at the German Embassy in Bucharest, but we are lucky to have her back in London now. Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Richard. Dear Martin distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to join you tonight at tonight's virtual event, which concludes the exciting journey of medieval manuscripts from German-speaking lands to digital libraries. 
It brings the Polonsky Foundation, Oxford Wolfenbüttel, German Manuscripts, digitization project, full circle. Also for me personally, as I was fortunate enough to help open the first chapter of the story of the project at its launch event in 2019. It is indeed very fitting that we are marking the transition of the written word beautifully illuminated and unique medieval manuscripts from places across Germany, such as Würzburg, Mainz or Reichenau, to a form readily accessible to everyone in the vastness of the internet by holding an online event. While Martin and I, as well as most of the panelists, or all of the pan most of the panelists, are sitting firmly in the analog world surrounded by the Bodleian's breathtaking treasures. This collaboration, jointly led by two world-renowned institutions, the Bodleian Libraries and the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel, and generously funded by Polonsky Foundation, bears vivid testimony not only to the centuries-old academic and cultural bonds between our countries, but also to the extent of our interconnectedness in academia and the culture sector today. Tonight is all about journeys that started centuries ago and that illustrate the dynamic cultural interaction between Germany and Britain and the various routes this takes. The story of the manuscripts and collections is part of a journey of exploration and discovery about each other. It is part of today's ceaseless cultural interchange between our countries, exemplified in our manifold Anglo-German elective affinities. Just think of cultural players like Hartwig Fischer heading the British Museum and Sir Simon Rattle taking over the Bavarian Rady Symphony, Symphony Orchestra in 2023. This journey of exploration has shaped our common destiny. We have married amongst each other in royal circles and beyond. We have struggled and fought with and against each other. We have looked into the abyss during two world wars. After the atrocities of World War II and the Nazi regime, we have thankfully become friends, allies and strategic European partners. And our relationship will continue to have vital significance, not just for our two countries, but for Europe and the wider world. Our countries have thrived on the rich texture of cultural connections between us, built over centuries. German-British relations have a depth and intensity, which are nowadays taken for granted. Perhaps not on a political level, but across the entire spectrum of what we define as culture and way of life, including vibrant academic and artistic exchange. After the UK has left the European Union and seeing that all of our countries are faced with immense challenges like the pandemic, climate change and international instability, there is a risk we will forget that this relationship did not materialize overnight, that it needs investment and commitment as well as the will and curiosity to engage with each other. In this spirit, libraries are champions and protectors of our cultural heritage. They preserve these connections between countries and cultures. The digitization of these treasures opens new doors for staying connected and sharing the wealth and beauty of medieval manuscripts from Germany and beyond with everyone. By projects like this and by reaching out, out digitally, we will keep enriching our societies and celebrating the values that make these journeys possible. Openness, curiosity, and the desire to care for our common heritage. Libraries, whether dig digital or analog, will continue to be paramount in defining our identity and our ties with each other. Before I close, please allow me to extend my heartfelt thanks to everybody who made this exciting venture and tonight's event possible. The teams at the Bodleian Libraries and the Herzog August Bibliothek, as well as the Polonsky Foundation. And last but not least, I would very much like to invite everybody to join us on this journey and explore the wonders of these medieval manuscripts from the comfort of their homes, which from now on they can do at the click of a mouse. And now I'm very much looking forward to the film we're going to see and to the expert panel discussion.
Julia, thank you so much. My name is Martin Kaufman. I'm head of early and rare collections here at the Bodleian, and it will be my pleasure to chair our panel discussion this afternoon. But before that, as Richard mentioned, we're going to the movies. The two libraries commissioned this short 10-minute film to introduce the project and to give some sense of the reality of the digitization process. Alas, it's a failure of online events that no popcorn can be served, but we hope you'll enjoy it. The project that we have with the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel in Germany is all about making available online, free to everyone, the riches of our medieval heritage, both in Germany and in Britain, and to explore culturally, intellectually, historically, that long history of interconnection that we have. Books, manuscripts are the best diplomats in the world helping us to overcome national boundaries. Our shared project has tried to do just that. This project is really important because it digitizes these unique sources, which both opens them up to academics across the globe, but also to members of the public. So it means that anyone can access these manuscripts at the click of a button, either on the project website or in the library's core digital platforms. The first stage of the digitization journey is to select the manuscripts and assess their suitability. We'd like to digitize all these manuscripts from Germany, but they have to be in good enough condition to be handled. And that's where the initial assessment by a conservator to see if they're fit for photography and if not, whether anything can be done to make them suitable for the handling in the photographic studio. The Bodleian has several hundred medieval manuscripts made in Germany in the Middle Ages and they were in German monasteries until the 17th century when during the Thirty Years' War their libraries were dispersed and were picked up by the agents of Archbishop William Lord, Archbishop of Canterbury and Chancellor of Oxford University, who had them brought to Oxford in the 1630s. And so these manuscripts, in a sense, are refugees from a time of violence and turbulence in Germany. Our partner library, in Wolfenbüttel, is also digitizing manuscripts which are also, in a sense, refugees because they were taken out of their religious houses um, at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And so by putting these manuscripts together digitally, you can reconstitute a medieval library on screen which are physically dispersed today. This is the first Bodleian digitization project where we've used exclusively high resolution, medium format digital camera backs. Throughout the project we've been using this piece of equipment, the Grazer Cradle. It's a stand which holds the camera and the manuscript during photography. It's unusual in that no glass or plastic is coming into contact with the surface of the page of the manuscripts. And so it's a fantastic tool for photographing the most fragile manuscripts that we have in our collections. 
The fore edge rests on this hollow bar which is attached to a hose and then a vacuum unit and that ensures that the page is parallel to the lens and completely still when we photograph it. We've been experimenting with direct lighting so that we can capture the colour of gold. Conventional lighting is at 40 degrees to the manuscript, but we found that the colour of the gold was often a dark grey or green. So in this case, I'm using a digitally controlled ring flash that reflects the gold leaf back to the lens and so that we can faithfully reproduce the colour of the gold. What we're trying to do when we're cataloguing manuscripts is to help people discover its textual contents, its decoration, its history. We do that by a detailed physical examination of the object. That information then goes into our online catalogue and it forms the basis of the record in the digital image library. So with a modern printed book, uh, the title page will tell you where and when it was printed, but it's very unusual for that to happen in manuscripts, so we have to do a lot more detective work. So with this manuscript, for example, the watermarks in the paper give us a good clue as to where and when it's likely to have been written, because we can compare the design with similar designs in paper used at known places and locations and dates, and by doing that we can see that it's likely to have been used in southern Germany around about 1530, and that's, that's very probably where this manuscript was made. After cataloguing and photography are complete, there's a process that we call digitisation, which is effectively creating some technical metadata of a team working behind the scenes, bring the images together into a digital object that can be accessed in the most efficient way possible on a number of digital platforms. One really important aspect of this project is both academic and public engagement, raising awareness of the project and these new sources. And we've done that in a range of ways, from curators being at academic conferences, to promoting the sources on Twitter amongst the medievalists there, but also public engagement activities. The previous year has been hugely challenging for public engagement. Whereas most of our activity would be in person, in a physical space, the COVID pandemic has, has made that almost impossible to do. So we have had to think about a new way of working in online delivery. We planned a range of activity to engage different members of the, the public, from public talks, calligraphy workshops, online craft activities for families, and singing workshops. And don't we decided to run a workshop which would um, allow people to engage through their screens in a way like in the Middle Ages. We were down in the crypt and we could sing from the manuscript. People sang along at home in front of their screens, so it was a virtual community that linked across the world. One of the biggest surprises of doing our work online is the increase in the number of people engaging with our activity and also where in the world that they're actually based. So usually we might have between 80 to 100 people at a physical activity. We're finding we're having 300 plus people attending our online events. And these people are truly global. They're in the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and all the way across Europe. There is an audience and demand for online content and therefore we will be incorporating that into all of our future work. One of the things which I hope this project will show for the future is that through the use of digital technologies, through the partnerships between great research and cultural institutions, 
that we can bring our communities together and that although we may exist in different countries with different histories and different political boundaries, so much more unites us than separates us. And I hope that this project will be replicated many times with other institutions and I hope that the Bodleian will be part of that movement of collaboration between the great libraries of the world. And so we come to our discussion. Two themes have arisen very powerfully from the project as it has proceeded. The first is the role of books in the long history of Anglo-German contacts and their fate at times of religious and political upheaval. Many of the medieval manuscripts included in the project could be counted as refugees at some point in their lives. On the Bodleian side, most of the manuscripts ended up in Oxford because of the dispersals of the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century. On the Wolfenbüttel side, the causes of the exile and movement of the manuscripts are more varied, and no one is better placed to tell us about them and to start our, our discussion than Peter Borschel. Peter is not only the director of our partner library, the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel, but also professor of early modern cultural history at the University of Göttingen. We are delighted that Peter can join us from his study in Germany. Thank you, Martin. Um, dear colleagues, dear friends, in 1568, Julius became Duke of Braunschweig and Lüneburg. In the same year, he introduced the Reformation. The consequences were keenly felt, not least by the religious houses in his principality, including their books and manuscripts, because prints and manuscripts that were deemed papist had to be confiscated and brought to Wolfenbüttel. But what did that mean, papist? Visitations were conducted, inventories were created, and it was finally decided what conformed to the pure Christian doctrine and was therefore useful and hence could remain in the clerical collections and what had to go. From some inventories, we can glean how thoroughly the princely experts went about their business before putting the selected pieces into chests, loading them on carriages, and taking them to Wolfenbüttel. In the spring of 1572 alone, cartloads of claimed papist books from nunneries in Dorstadt, Heinigen and Städterburg near Wolfenbüttel, Marienberg near Helmstedt, Wöltingerode near Goslar and Lamspringe between Hildesheim and Göttingen arrived in the residency where they received notices of receipt and found a new home in the, by the way, heatable rooms of the chancellery close by the palace. Numerous manuscripts that had deeply shaped the spirituality, but also the liturgical life in the affected monasteries over a long period were added. From the Cistercian monastery in Wöltingerode, for instance, about 85 manuscripts reached Wolfenbüttel, including two psalters from the first half of the 13th century. In exchange, the monasteries and nunneries received 
German language Bibles translated by Martin Luther, as well as Reformed writings. One of the inventories tells us that Julius had the Augustinian's nun at Stetabrook informed which writings should henceforth be read and when they should be picked up in Wolfenbüttel at their own cost, as is explicitly specified. While the new prince's approach was common practice, it does not come as a surprise that complaints were made, complaints that adumbrate how profoundly the loss of books and manuscripts changed, changed the daily spiritual and social routines in the convents. These complaints, however, are also revealing with regard to the history of our collection. To name just one example, when the Mother Superior and the convent of the Benedictine Monastery in Lamspringe sent Julius a note of protest against the confiscation of their church treasure in the spring of 1573, they listed among the gems of the treasure two evangeliaries giving a detailed description of their covers. We can assume that these were parchment manuscripts from the 10th century. The religious disputes, the confessional conflicts of the early modern period up to the Thirty Years' War turned the manuscripts of our joint project into migrants, again and again into refugees, and in some cases into exulants. As we know, when Archbishop Lord began collecting, collecting manuscripts, he bought many that came on the market as monastic libraries on the continent, especially in Germany, were despoiled in the campaigns of the Thirty Years' War. Between 1635 and 1640, he gave 1, around 1,300 manuscripts to the Bodleian. By the way, we can also name that knowledge circulation. But what does that mean? Books, manuscripts are cosmopolitans. And as cosmopolitans, as I say in the film, they are the best diplomats in the world. Having us, helping us to overcome national boundaries and other constrictions, helping us to enter into cooperations. Libraries have to take the cosmopolitical background of their books and manuscripts seriously. They have to listen to them. Our shared project has tried to do just that, which was, which is a wonderful, uplifting experience. Peter, thank you so much. The witness of books to the long history of Anglo-German contacts goes even further back. In our project, they begin with the Anglo-Saxon missionaries who took Christianity to the continent of Europe in the 8th century. The religious houses they founded produced manuscripts which continued in their script and decoration to show evidence of their origins as can be seen in the manuscripts from the age of Charlemagne, which were produced at Würzburg Cathedral and are today in the Bodleian. Our guide to these connections is Joanna Storey. Jo is Professor of Early Medieval History at the University of Leicester and was the co-curator of the once-in-a-lifetime exhibition of Anglo-Saxon manuscripts at the British Library in 2018. Welcome, Jo. Thank you, Martin, and thank you for the invitation to uh, talk to you today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as we've heard, manuscripts travel. 
And round about the year 700, clerics from the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, especially from Northumbria and Wessex, began missionary activity in the northern and eastern parts of the Frankish kingdom. And in some ways, these missionaries, people like Boniface and Willibrord, thought that their mission was to bring Christianity to pagan peoples who were their distant kin. They remembered the stories of migration and settlement centuries before that were recirculating at the time in the early 8th century through the works of scholars such as Bede. Now, these English missionaries to Eastern Francia were given support by the local aristocracy, especially the Carolingian family, who went on to usurp the Merovingians in 751 in a coup that made them the ruling dynasty, and which, by the end of the century, under Charlemagne, became the dominant cultural, political, and military force in the post-Roman post West. With Carolingian support, these Anglo-Saxon missionaries founded numerous religious houses that were staffed both by Anglo-Saxon emigrants and by local Franks. And these Anglo-Saxon foundations in Francia needed books and libraries to function. And they acquired these books in two ways. They imported books ready-made from the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, and they also developed their own scriptoria to make books locally, both for the service of the church and for the monastic library. So during the 8th century, Scriptoria attached to these Anglo-Saxon monasteries in the Frankish kingdom began to produce books in Francia using the methods of production and scripts of their homelands. It's what we call in insular style. Manuscripts written in insular script continue to be made in these places well into the Carolingian period, and in some places, insular script carried on being used long after Caroline Minuscule that was promoted under Charlemagne became ubiquitous across the rest of the Frankish realm. And this was a form of local identity building, and it also implied a sort of residual attachment to the Anglo-Saxon, or English, if you like, homeland, that persisted for several generations after the original English founders had died. So strong was this use of insular script in Germany that almost 45% of all extant manuscripts in insular script survive in German libraries today. And there are two especially important inf insular foundations that maintained this practice of using insular script and bookmaking practices um, that are very well represented in the collections of Oxford and Wolfenbüttel. That is the monasteries at, at Würzburg and at Fulda. Both were places that had been founded under the influence of Boniface, the West Saxon missionary bishop, and both were led initially by men who came from Britain. Some of the most important datable manuscripts from Fulda are at Wolfenbüttel and are in insular script, including the earliest copy of Charlemagne's grand reform capitulary, the Admonitio Generalis, which was a foundational text for the Carolingian Renaissance. A very substantial proportion of the extant manuscripts from Würzburg were given to the Bodleian by Archbishop Lord, as we've heard, now expertly catalogued by Daniela Meyerhofer, and many are now digitized uh, through the Polonsky project. Um, and many of those that are in insular script um, are included in that collection. And among these that have now been digitized through the Polonsky project are two supremely important manuscripts that exemplify this theme of journeys, manuscript journeys. One of them is uh, the book called The Laudian Acts, Lord Grecai 35, which is a 6th century Italian bilingual uh, copy of the Acts of the Apostles in Latin and in Greek which seems very likely to have been imported into Anglo-Saxon England and may even have been, used, be the, been the copy that was used by Bede at Jarrow. We then have clear evidence through an ex libris that it was taken to Germany by the end of the century, so by around about the year 800. There is a scratched ex libris uh, for the monastery at Hornbach, um, and it seems to have stayed there perhaps right up until the Reformation. This is a very, very important manuscript for the history of the Bible, and it's a perfect example of the way that books moved across Europe in the early Middle Ages, from Sardinia to Northumbria and then to the Rhineland. The other important manuscript that's been recently digitized is the copy of, some, of Augustine's De Trinitate, Lord Miss 126, that was probably made by the nuns at Shell near Paris in around about 750. But it has two texts in it that were copied at the leaves at the front and at the end of the book, both in insular script of, of Würzburg, round about the year 800. 
The text at the front is a copy of a letter by Charlemagne to Abbot Balgul for Fulda, informing him about the new expectations for education and schools in monasteries in the Frankish kingdom. And this was being dispersed uh, to Wolfenbüttel, this letter. But at the back is a list of manuscripts, a list of 34 books that were held in Würzburg by around about 800. And the very first in the list is named as the Acts of the Apostles, which is quite probably the book that we've just discussed. The fifth item is the Historia Anglorum by Bede. So that was circulating in uh, Francia by around about 800. And in the right-hand column were four books that had been loaned to Fulda and another to the monastery at Holzkirchen Holz near Würzburg. We have evidence, therefore, for, if you like, an interlibrary loan system operating out of Würzburg uh, in uh, the uh, late 8th century. Joe, thank you. <laughs> the second theme, which has arisen so clearly during the course of the project, is that of the place of manuscripts in a digital age. The pandemic has merely accelerated the move of libraries towards digital resources. But at the same time, historical and literary studies have seen a turn away from more purely theoretical approaches and towards a renewed interest in physical books and manuscripts as the carriers of material and textual evidence from the past. The person who can begin to reconcile these opposing forces for us is Henrika Lehnemann. Henrika is Professor of Medieval German Literature and Linguistics here at Oxford. She works on both German and Latin texts in manuscripts. She's a pioneer in the creation and use of digital resources for teaching. And she's a terrific ambassador for this project and for medieval studies more widely. Over to you, Henrika. Many thanks, Martin, for the introduction. For me, as you can imagine, this project is a research dream come true. But what I want to talk about today is not so much my own research, but how this has helped me with teaching. And I've inherited from my esteemed predecessor, Professor Nigel Palmer, here in the audience, a course called History of the Book and Paleography. And I added to that digital humanities. And the last year has really seen these three elements come together uh, under challenging uh, circumstances, but trying to reimagine how you can teach history of the book, physical objects on a, in a digital way. So um, the Polonsky German project has really provided crucial, crucial data for my students. And I will take three examples of manuscripts digitized in the projects and link them with key aspects of digitization. The first case is a manuscript for which the catalog entry in the Handschriftenzensus, the seminal digital portal for German manuscripts, was just one line long. Deutsch, Lateinische, Geistliche, Sammelhandschrift. All six uh, Germanists um, on the master course undertook it to unscramble this Latin German miscellany. They developed their own transcription principles each of them encoded a number of folios in XML and researched one aspect of the manuscript, such as the dialect or the binding. It was fascinating to watch the students finding out piece by piece more information. But even more fascinating was to see them mastering paleography via a team or rather a team's effort. The availability of the high resolution digital facsimile allowed puzzling together online over marginalia and to formulate hypotheses which then could be tested on the material object. Some things were only possible via the image, such as deciphering the traces of text left by a removed paste down, which had to be mirrored to become legible again. So first aspect, communal editing via digitalization. The second uh, example, is the addition of one of the best-loved German manuscripts in the Bodleian, a travelogue, featuring fantastic beasts and where to find them. Several generations of history of the book students had worked on this volume, 
attracted by the crocodiles as well as oriental alphabets. You quickly saw the crocodile actually in the film. Um, and then uh, going on from there how um, it came to Oxford. The digitization allowed us to bring together for the launch of the edition of the volume two Erasmus interns working with me in Hillary term who did the encoding with three former students of the course both from Germany and England talking about the history of the book aspects they had been working on in previous years. I'm grateful for the uh, to the technical team um, in going to great lengths to make it possible for me to show a snippet of the launch where you can see how we made the physical and digital manuscript meet. Sort of helping to solve the mystery of the provenance of MS Bodley 970 and how this travelogue came to travel to Oxford. So thanks very much for listening and I'm, I'm going to now pass over to Henrika who's going to talk a little bit more about this edition and its transmission. Thanks very much. Thanks Aisha and uh, thanks Andrew for patiently turning back and forth uh, the manuscript. So Andrew Dun yeah. <laughs> what you just saw was Andrew Dunning um, holding a lighting sheet under the letter with which the manuscript was sent to the Bodleian, then switching over to the digital edition with the integrated triple IF uh, image viewer on the website of the Taylor Editions. If you were to watch on, you would see two further manuscripts coming on screen. Our inquiries with other libraries in Germany have led to new digitizations both in Trier and in Cologne, so that after this year, um, the kind of mushroomed digitization of manuscripts, which wouldn't have happened if we hadn't tried to explore this online. So uh, second uh, Moral von der Geschichte linking up with other scholars and libraries to, through digitization. My third example is the new potential for teaching made possible by having several manuscripts from the same religious house online together. For years I've been teaching the basic of paleography by using an exercise booklet um, here. Um, written by the nuns in a meeting to teach lay sisters how to write proper Gothic. Um, thanks to the Polonsky German project, eight more manuscripts from the Cistercian Abbey of Meeding, where this little booklet came from, are now online. I still hand out the booklet to the students, but now they can play spot the difference between this little model volume and the digitized devotional manuscripts from the convent. Next week, I will use this material to teach a master class at Freiburg University with a number of worksheets developed by one of my graduate students, each requiring students to focus on different aspects of the Bodleian online manuscripts, zooming in both sense of this word in and out of the manuscripts. I want to finish my series of examples of insights gained via manuscript digitization with a tongue in cheek uh, book object. It is this paper poster announcing the workshop on the methodology of digital editing by typesetting the languages which were represented in the digital edition launches with wooden book block superimposed on a screen print um, printed in the workshop over in the Schola Musica and uh, that printed the URL for the online event in typesetting. A symbol that the digital cannot exist without the physical object but that each side can lead to creative new engagements with the fascination of manuscripts. Henrika, thank you. Now, it may come as a shock to some, though perhaps not so much after seeing the film, but the digitization of manuscripts is painstaking work and it costs money. The educational charities which support this work enter into a partnership with the libraries which look after these treasures and play an increasingly important role in helping to shape their aims and direction. But their voice is too rarely heard in public forums, which is all the more reason for us to hear from Mark Polonsky. Mark is managing trustee of the Polonsky Foundation, 
the charity which has supported this digitization project and others with the aim of widening access to the unique collections of libraries. It is the vision of the Polonsky Foundation to create new partnerships between libraries in different countries. Mark, we are delighted to have you with us. Thank you, Martin, and thank you for inviting me to, to be here. Uh, so Martin's asked me to talk a little bit about uh, the funder's perspective in relation to projects like this. Uh, so let me say th three or four, focus on three or four things in particular. Uh, first of all, we are drawn to the area of, of digitization because it is such an extraordinary opportunity, the, the technological advance that uh, enables these riches of cultural heritage to be brought to everyone at the click of a mouse, as, as, as you said, Julia, uh, uh, to anyone in the world, uh, free is so, so powerful a, an idea that we've been drawn to working in this area. Um, and as you mentioned, Martin, we, we look for collaborations. Uh, and collaborations, of course, bring about immediate benefits of uh, institutions sharing best practice and developing uh, developing relationships with each other which uh, and it was particularly important to us to uh, f find a project which could link the Bodleian with a, uh, a peer institution in Germany for the cultural and historical reasons uh, among others that that Julia mentioned uh, earlier uh, but collaborations also, apart from the immediate benefits of bringing two institutions together to, to learn from each other and share practice, also contribute to a broader uh, uh, creation of, of networks and development of standards, uh, which, which means that practice within digitization can, uh, can spread. Um, uh, and of course, it also means that there is uh, can, 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 can avoid duplication, um, and there can be various efficiencies that come from institutions working together. Uh, as far as the material is concerned, um, it, it's important for us to find uh, material that has lasting research value. Uh, but also that can be uh, brought to the attention and uh, excite and inspire a broader public. Now, with esoteric materials like these, it, it takes greater uh, ingenuity and imagination to find ways to make those materials uh, more, more widely popular. So I uh, have to compliment um, uh, Enrique, who's been the most marvelous uh, uh, pr pr promoter and ambassador for these materials and the, the, the public engagement team generally uh, in uh, Bodleian and Hetzelkogel's Bibliothek who have explored innovative ways to bring this material to life. Um, and in the process of that, of course, building up communities, uh, uh, communities of, of researchers and scholars, uh, communities of, of, of yeah, lay people who have, uh, who have uh, an interest in different aspects of, of these um, materials. And those aspects are not just the content, uh, but the techniques involved. As we saw in, uh, in, in the film, uh, there, there are ways in which people have a great interest in, uh, in learning and perpetuating the techniques that uh, led to these the creation of these manuscripts. Uh, and so what we look for in terms of benefits uh, uh, or impact, uh, to use the, 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 the favored word, um, are, are first of all academic engagement. Uh, and that academic engagement isn't, uh, isn't immediate. Uh, it, it's, it's really only when the materials are available to scholars that new research uh, avenues and possibilities open up. Uh, also public in engagement and outreach of the kind we've talked about, but also preservation of, of, of other skills. Uh, as, as you've seen, as you know, digitization projects have a lot of different phases. There's the, uh, including cataloging, which, uh, which requires 
uh, extraordinary uh, in-depth knowledge and uh, it's important for that, that knowledge to be uh, perpetuated. Uh, so, uh, and then also the, the technical skills of involved in the digitization, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the techniques that we saw in the film, the wonderful photography, clever use of photography. So those are the sort of benefits that we uh, like to be able to support in, uh, 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 in these projects. Uh, and so maybe I'll just, just finish by, by noting that uh, the, the project began in the shadow of Brexit and now at this stage we're in the shadow of COVID, uh, but that just, I suppose, gives us an opportunity to recognize the, the importance of looking at the longer term picture. And, and although we're celebrating and marking now uh, the end of a particular phase, it's really also just the beginning of a new phase in this project where these materials will be explored and, uh, and enjoyed. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much. And now comes the chance for all of us to join a discussion and um, there are some questions already um, coming in from our audience, which I will I will challenge and uh, which I will channel and throw to whichever of our panelists seems um, appropriate or most eager. Um, but the first one, um, I want to pursue just in a little more depth this question of the digital age and the generations growing up in the digital age. Um, and I want to go back to um, a, a visionary article by the German um, uh, cultural historian and theorist Walter Benjamin, um, written between the two world wars, called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And he forecasts, it was a sort of visionary um, essay, and he forecasts that in an age when so much reproduction of original artworks, we might say manuscripts, was possible, the originals would lose their appeal, their, their aura, their interest, their charisma. And I think it was a pioneering article. I, I'm inclined to think that it got things exactly the wrong way round, that the endless reproduction has merely enhanced um, that aura, but I'd be very interested to confront this if any of our... Um, Joe, I don't know if... Uh, well, you're probably talking to the wrong people here because, of course, we all, you know, respond immediately to the, the real object when it's in front of us. And I think everybody in this room and everybody who's listening will, who's ever encountered a manuscript in person will, be, will know that thrill of the, of, of the original sitting there in front of you. The smell of it as much as anything else, which is something you cannot reproduce digitally, is, is, is something that every, stays with everybody. Um, but I think there's an important point to be made about um, the digitization of uh, medieval manuscripts, which is exactly this point about the uh, uniqueness of each copy. And even if you have a copy of m many copies of the same text, each copy is different. And that is one of the sort of really fundamental reasons why it's not sufficient just to have one copy of one digitization of a medieval text or of a copy of a medieval text. You have to have copies of, you have to have digitizations of all of the different copies because they are all different. And um, I think that answers it in two ways, really, that the, the originals remain essential and special. And there are some things that you cannot get at through digitization that you can through, um, through engagement with the original, but also that each original is different. Um, and that's one of the, the most important reasons, as, as Henrika said, you know, with the, the example that she gave, she's got one copy that her students have been looking at, but look, there are several others as well. And how much more you can learn by um, looking at that sort of palimpsest of, of different copies of the same text made at different times because no one is the same as another. 
Yeah, uh, I've asked all my students to write blog posts throughout their project, and for most of them, um, the encounter with the manuscript started with the digitized uh, version, and now in Trinity term, uh, uh, one by one, they have been able to have a personal date, and some of them have really described it as a, a, a love encounter with somebody they had got to know <laughs> on, via an online dating platform. And it, it, I got the most emotional blog posts. I had sometimes had to tone them down <laughs> uh, about uh, what changed in their appreciation of an object with which they had letter by letter really engaged through the encoding over the months. But I, I was constantly also reminded of uh, the period I work on for research and the manuscripts from meeting, which were written in a time of um, when the nuns could have just ordered, um, not online, but uh, via uh, the local bookseller, a printed copy of a prayer book. Uh, but uh, they went for the handwritten um, object as a way of devotional engagement with a text. And whether you do it for a religious purpose or for uh, engaging with a text uh, in a different way, um, the handwritten product uh, keeps uh, this aura and can't be replaced uh, by uh, the customer, by the uh, pre-produced print version or by the digital uh, version, but it can be yeah. complemented. And there's another aspect of it, I think, which um, uh, people will recognize, which is that of scale. Mm -hmm. And yeah. on, a, on a computer screen, a digital computer image, even you know, of the quality that we've, we've seen with, with, with this project, they're all the same size because it fills to fit the screen. And uh, the response that most people have, with, even with books that they, they know really well, the first time they see it is, oh, it's huge, or oh, it's so tiny, small, yeah. it's tiny. And, and it's that sense of, of, of scale as well, which I think is something that is, is still a challenge to, um, for, for digitization, to think about how you get across that sense of the, the physical three-dimensionality of the object that you're, yeah. that you're, that you're looking at. And here, really, a big uh, word of praise for the curators at uh, the Bodleian uh, Library, because um, what Andrew Dunning and Matthew Holford and uh, you have been doing with uh, being the eyes and hands for uh, users has been amazing. And uh, I wanted to show this short clip just to see how what um, even in this very poor resolution of our uh, screen shot uh, teams call, still the physical turning of a page can add uh, as experience. For me, um, the, one of the first manuscripts we looked at was a sp early Spanish um, manuscript um, with Portulan maps. And um, the student who had been working on it uh, was at that moment in the States. And she was drinking a cup of coffee while Andrew turning, was turning the pages. And I shouted at her because I, I was so taken in by uh, the proximity of the manuscript and the cup of coffee uh, that I, uh, for a moment, completely forgot that I was sitting in front of a screen and was uh, neither in the presence of the manuscript nor of the student. <laughs> Um, the questions are coming in, and the next one may be actually for our, our two directors who are, are with us on the on the, on the screen. Um, one of the one of the questions was um, quite pithy, um, saying, "What's next?" But another another um, expanded that. Um, to ask about the choice of what to digitize. We, we, we have the privilege of looking after libraries with, with many thousands of manuscripts, many millions of printed books. And how do we decide? We, as we've seen, um, digitization is a painstaking um, job. How do we decide what to digitize? Is it just our aim to digitize everything as fast as we can? How do we go about choosing? And I don't know whether Peter or Richard um, would like to respond first as the leaders of, of these great libraries. 
well, pe perhaps Martin, I could speak, uh, and I, there's just a point I'd like to make regarding the earlier discussion, which is about how important it is, I think, for both the li libraries who are doing digitization, but also for teachers like uh, Joe and Henrika to ensure that students are able to come and see those originals and not to be complacent in relying on the digital version. So we must all work together to uh, make those opportunities as frequent as possible because otherwise I think there is a danger that there will be a generation that does not have those wonderful experiences in those seminar rooms looking at or in reading rooms looking at originals and uh, so I think we've got to we're, we're obviously incredibly privileged in Oxford because we we, we have m multiple college libraries as well as the Bodleian who have rich collections and we can provide those opportunities but for many people in other places that's not so easy and so we've got to make that um, possible to uh, enable that experience to go alongside the digital experiences that we're in, you know, trying our very best to expand. But if I can just go uh, answer, I have a first go before handing over to Peter, um, the point about selection. Uh, and I think it is one where it's when you're on, you have a large scale of materials that could be digitized, like our two institutions have. Um, that very often it's actually led by funding. So where funding opportunities drive you, um, where uh, either from philanthropic foundations or um, from research opportunities, which may be generated by scholars leading projects which come with funding to enable digitization to happen. Of course, in order to be able to respond to those opportunities, institutions must have a sense of their own uh, priority or capabilities um, and where particularly where materials have been catalogued to a high standard, um, it makes the digitization so much easier, faster and cheaper because that work is absolutely essential to go alongside the, the actual imaging s side of the project. Thank you, Richard. Um, I don't know if Peter Burschel would like to um, also I, to speak to that theme. Yeah. I, I just, just can underline uh, what Richard uh, um, said, um, but I would add there is a connection between the first and the second question and it's it's it is a fundamental perhaps no problem but it is a fundamental question because it has something to do with authenticity and uh, that's one aspect the second aspect is you you all know this question um and I'm, I'm, I, I must confess, I am a Walter Benjamin fan, but um, uh, uh, you, you all know this, this question, is digitization uh, earlier or later the end of the library or of the library uh, we know? Um, and um, so I don't think so. I, would, I, I, I don't think so that it would be uh, uh, good to to confront digitization on the one hand and the I don't know the the material culture the authenticity of our of our collections it's it, we should we shouldn't confront these both sides uh, sides of one medal but uh, we all know it's something we we have to to, to think about and we have to find ways or we have to find perspectives um, uh, to, to, uh, to, for, for the future. Um, and it's, it's a question, what's the library of the future? Um, and this question is, is an interesting question, is an, but it's not so easy um, to, to answer these questions in, in two or three words. My, Confession is digitization and our books, our manuscripts are two sides of one coin. 
Thank you. Um, Mark. Let me just uh, add something. R Richard mentioned that uh, selection depends to some extent on funding. Uh, and I, I, I would say that uh, when we were discussing with Richard a new project, because we had already worked with the Bodleian on a successful uh, collaboration between the Bodleian and the Vatican Library to um, digitize uh, complementary parts of their collection. And we, we were discussing with Richard what project we could do with a German library. Uh, and a number, and, and you know, there were a number of possibilities, uh, but I suppose what clinched it was, first of all, you know, a good partner. So Ri you know, Richard identified um, Herzog August Bibliothek as uh, you know, an institution that he was confident he could successfully work with uh, and the project would be done successfully as, as we are marking today. Um, and, uh, 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 and secondly, of course, that the materials are complementary in some, some way. Um, I mean, not, it, the, there were other projects that were considered which would have involved digital reconstruction where you have one collection that's actually been you know, dispersed into two institutions and you're bringing together the yeah, digitally, that collection. Uh, this, in, in, in this case, that's different. The materials are from uh, diverse uh, uh, provenance, but the, co the collections were complementary. Um, and, and the third important element, as Richard adverted to, was that there was already a very comprehensive cataloging uh, of the uh, manuscripts from German speaking lands, which yeah, made sense to, to build on, um, to uh, you mean that a, a project of this kind was achievable and uh, uh, affordable uh, in a way that wouldn't have been the case if the cataloguing hadn't already been done. Thank you. There are all kinds of questions coming in about um, techniques of digitization, which I, um, uh, and, and I can't do justice to them all in, in the short time we have. But one very interesting one is about the future. We've emphasized perhaps the fragility of books, but at the same time, they are great survivors. These books have been moved around and dispersed at times of political upheaval, but they have been collected and survived. Um, would any of the panel like to comment on which will last longer, the digital um, um, copies of these um, manuscripts or the manuscripts themselves? Who would like to volunteer? Uh, Henrika is. Uh... Um, I, I think what we uh, discussed when we started the project in uh, this very room, um, the opening, was that each digitization brings new questions and you can't really foresee in which direction it will take you. So we wouldn't have uh, been able to foresee how to combine things like visualizer images with uh, high resolution uh, going into the polls and I've even seen over the last year how new um, research questions have come up uh, thanks to uh, the images but this also means that um, the digitization by necessity has to be um, uh, isn't the final step it will always be uh, an incentive to go further to the 3D modeling, uh, for example, um, as um, some pr um, experiments have been uh, done with the Ashmolean, for example, on the objects and t uh, turning pages. Um, in, in that way, I think for me as a literary scholar, it's similar to translations. So uh, uh, you can't have the German Shakespeare. Um, you will um, have the challenge to translate it for each generation new, but also you have the opportunity. Um, so if you go to a Shakespeare performance in uh, German, you won't have dead jokes because you can update any obscenity or a pun uh, while you can't update Shakespeare. So 
uh, both the translation and the original have uh, their Daseinsberechtigung, and uh, the same is the case for the digitization and the manuscript. Can I, can I, can I come in on that? Um, uh, it only takes one small change to a URL to lose the, to lose the link. And I am wondering whether I ought to ask you this question or not, Martin, but have you ever tried to rip a piece of parchment? Um. It is almost <laughs> impossible. <laughs> so manuscripts are, are made of animal skin. They're made of tough hide. They last a long time if they're kept in uh, the correct type of environment. Manuscripts are tough things. That's why people wrote on, they chose animal skin to write on. The digital is ephemeral. We have to look after it as well. And we certainly have to look after the people who help us make those digital images. So we have to curate these things in different ways. We have to curate our uh, digital images carefully and think about that. And we have to curate our curators too. Uh, Richard. Uh, I, I was going to say just wearing uh, another hat that I, I wear, which is president of the Digital Preservation Coalition, I think um, what projects like these do is, of course, they share our riches, but they actually create something else that we have to preserve. And that's the, the digital surrogate and all the, the other, either the metadata and all the other digital material that goes alongside it. And it has created another aspect of the work of great libraries, uh, as preserving institutions and um, it's both to preserve the analog past and the digital present and those things are equally of great importance but they are as Joe has rightly said they pose different challenges and uh, what they do do is they increase the cost of being a library, of doing the core work of a library. And that's something that we all must work together. So that's where collaboration between libraries becomes even more important because no one institution can do this alone. We must share the expertise and the technologies and indeed the task. Um, but also we must work together to articulate the need for libraries and indeed archives in this digital world even more in the future because of the key role that preservation plays for society, which is, I think, a point that uh, uh, Julia Gross was making um, in her very powerful words at the start of this session. Richard, thank you. Well, um, these are wide and deep subjects which would merit discussion late into the evening. Um, but all too quickly, we've reached the end of our allotted time. Um, it only remains for me to apologize to any members of the audi remote audience whose questions haven't, we haven't had time to pick up, um, but mainly to thank our panelists, um, the staff of the Bodleian and the Herzog August Bibliothek for all their work on the project and in staging this event, the Polonsky Foundation and the German Embassy for their ongoing support, and above all, you the audience for your interest and your participation. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>